Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's program at the NUS Baba House. I'm Danielle, uh, Assistant Manager from the Outreach Team here. This evening, we are pleased to have uh, three individuals with us who are very much involved with topics of visual culture and the politics of representation through art and design. And we'll be coming from various perspectives, such as the philosophy of art, design, and subject-object relations within Chinese culture and beyond. Let me introduce you to the moderator for this evening, uh, Michael. Michael Lee is an artist and curator based in Singapore. He researches urban memory and fiction, especially the context and implications of loss. He transforms his observations into objects, texts, uh, diagrams, situations, uh, or curations, such as this work, which was part of one of the earliest Baba House exhibitions in 2008. Uh, the title, title of the artwork, An Almost, Almost Natural History of Social Relations, inspires the panel discussion this evening. Uh, I will now allow Michael to introduce more about himself, the artwork, um, the panelists, and their presentations. Uh, have a good evening ahead. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome, welcome, everybody, uh, to Baba House. House. We are here at the third level gallery. Um, on 157 New Road, and um, we're actually within the exhibition titled Glossaries of the Straits Chinese Homemaking. And this evening, we are very honored and happy to have two very esteemed guests to share with us um, a little bit about their research on issues surrounding culture, representation, art, and design. Um, I'm very honored to um, have my work served as the backdrop of today's events. I remember this artwork fondly for two reasons. Um, this was one of the works I made um, when I was invited to uh, open Baba House with a solo show. And um, it was also my first mind map that I created as an artwork. Um, and I, I remember it also as a way for me to make sense of a lot of visual symbols and physical artifacts that I encountered in my research for the solo show. And I'm honored that um, it's now gracing this event, um, which is, whose title is Visualizing Glossaries, Representation, Design and Connections. So today's panel takes its cue from cultural representations seen is in this exhibition, Glossaries of the Straits Chinese Homemaking, with my work as the starting point of how visual culture and the construction of memory might reify a cultural identity with a grounding in the philosophy of art, design, and subject-object relations. The panel will um, bring together discussions about interests in visual culture and the politics of representation through art and design, framing connections between different things like past and present, fact and fiction, as well as the local and global. The sequence of events for this evening will be that each of the two speakers, um, namely um, Assistant Professor Kevin Strom, as well as Associate Professor Cindy Wang, will have 20 minutes to make their presentation and that will be followed by a discussion. So if you have um, any questions um, 
burning questions already. You can already start typing these questions into the Zoom chat uh, function. And I'll be introducing each um, speaker uh, before the presentation, starting with Kevin. Kevin Strom is an anthropologist working at the National University of Singapore, uh, specifically at the intersection of visual anthropology, art, materialisms, and experimental ethnography in settler colonial situations. He is especially interested in how relationships between objects and things as assemblages offer political affordances in situations of racializations, dispossessions, and confinements. His work has been published in various journals and publications, including Collaborative Anthropologies, Journal of Ethnographic Theory, and American Anthropologies. He's currently completing a book project entitled Experiments in Living, Art and Politics in a Settler Colony. Over to you, Kevin. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Uh, as the anthropologist on the panel, I thought maybe it would be good to start with clarifying what I do, like clarifying what does an anthropologist who works on art do? So, so anthropology has always had a, has a long history with art. We've looked, you know, we've looked at art since probably the early 20th century with Franz Boas, his primitive art book, where he being a classic up to today, where we have a lot of works that are very collaborative. I'm not sure where to look on the screen up here. So what I want to do is kind of situate where I'm in this sort of field called anthropology of art. Um, for many years, anthropologists approached art as representational, right? We, we talked about art that represented other cultures or represented people's identities or ways of life or different values or all these different facets of, of representation. And anthropologists were there to sort of work through those artworks and to understand how that sort of process of representation happened and then the way that those works of art entered into and got distributed and got received and sort of sort of consumed. Probably over the last, I'd say, 20 years, this, this discussion has kind of shifted and, and, and anthropology is sort of going, yes, all art is to a degree representational, but at the same time, art does things, art objects do things. And it's this question about what does art do? And what, what, what do these objects do? What kind of, and in particular, what are the social processes that art objects create, invent? What do they establish? What is that sort of social agency of artworks, if you will? And this is kind of like where I enter into the field. I'm very interested in thinking through this idea that artworks do things, that they become in themselves social actors. But to do this, there's been a lot of writing around it, but I, I feel that you know, there's still a lot to be said around this idea. And I hope today to sort of give you an example of kind of what I do in that vein. So there's more than representational, right? There's not to say that artworks are not representational, but the more than representational. So I'm going to start with looking at an artwork from my own research that's been taking place over the last decade in Palestine, Israel, working with Palestinian artists inside Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, many, many names for them. And just kind of taking one work and maybe sort of working through that and giving an example that that I think sort of brings to the table a lot of the key points about thinking about artworks as actors. And I think hopefully in the end, using that as a sort of jumping off point to think about what you're doing in this this piece behind us. This is the work I'm going to be talking about. The Etikan is a a work that was done in 2012 by the artist Nardin Suji, who lives in Haifa. Um, I'll just give you a brief description of this piece. It's a metal funnel, clearly, with a small glass bottle at the bottom. Uh, the funnel you don't see, but the funnel is actually suspended in midair, just hovering, so you don't see the attachment to the ceiling. It's three meters high and three meters wide at top. Uh, stainless steel held together with rivets, an impressive piece. And, you know, unfortunately, I never got to see it, but I got to hear a lot about it because I had just left my field work at this time. What I want to do is I want to look at this artwork and sort of describe what I, what I 
and, and sort of work through this artwork, work with it and through it. He described three scenes that I have sort of been writing about in terms of this art object. So let me go through these three scenes and then sort of offer at the end of that kind of a, a theoretical apparatus that I'm going to use to sort of think through those three scenes. So for anybody who knows kind of what's going on in Palestine, Israel, you know that this is a contested space, occupations, colonization, history, historically since 1948 and, and before, this, is, this has been a contentious area, let's to put the least, right? But across the West Bank, throughout the sort of boundaries or borders between Israel and Palestine, are a series of checkpoints. And this piece, in a sense, is a representation of that sort of experience of the checkpoint. It's kind of this feeling when you go through a checkpoint, when, when very famously, when I went through Kalandia checkpoint in 2010, you get funneled. You get into this, what's called a funnel trap. And this is the kind of piece that sort of puts, puts that in your face in a way, right? I mean, you have this sort of way of thinking about and, and, and visualizing that kind of experience for Palestinians. And, they, and, and, and most Palestinians would connect with this this artwork for that very reason, of this sort of confinement. And the word etikan also means block, it's a verb to mean blockage or impediment or to constrain. So it also brings, the very title of the work brings all of these to the fore. Now, these, it's important to recognize it's not just about the checkpoint, it's about a series of apparatus, apparati, whether it's ID cards, whether it's checkpoints, whether it's house raids, whether it's confiscation of land, all these forms become forms of, of a funnel trap, right? The thing you, you sort of find yourself forced down but can't get out of, right? So that's kind of the first of the, the scenes that I want to paint. I, I, I mean, I could elaborate further, but I think the point is clear. The second point I want to talk about, the second scene, if you will, is the gallery where this piece was first shown. So this is a gallery in Haifa. Uh, it's called the Beta Geffen Gallery. It's an Arab Jewish sort of coexistence cultural center where, you know, state funds go into sort of promoting this sort of artists coming together and having shows together and sort of finding ways to have dialogues with each other. And what's interesting about the installation of this particular piece, and Nardim was very smart about how she installed it, the work in a sense is very site specific. She sort of looked at the room and said, I want to do something that takes up the room. That, so that when the viewer walks in, they become sort of feeling that feeling of congestion. So this is quite a small room. There's only one small doorway entrance to the room. And then you walk in and you, you kind of have to sort of move around the work. It sort of forces you to the side. And then you have this giant sort of opaque metal surface, which is, the, the materiality is very important here, right? The materiality plays a role in that effect. That it, and affect that it's trying to create. So, so this gallery, gallery was is frequented, frequent and what you know, we could elaborate on what kind of was going on because this is also, you know, Palestinians inside Israel and this sort of the idea of a liberal democracy of Israel as a liberal democracy and Palestinian artists sort of having the opportunity to show, and what is it like for a Jewish Israeli to sort of see this work? What do they think? What do they feel? What is it like for a Palestinian to see this piece and what do they think and what do they feel? And these questions and the way that you sort of then get into that confined space and what does that create? So we have these two scenes, the first two scenes, right? We have the checkpoint, which is this ubiquitous checkpoint that Palestinians face. And then you have the second scene, which is the gallery itself. And, and in a sense, what's important about the gallery is that the artwork, in a sense, doesn't just represent anymore the checkpoint or that experience of the checkpoint, it becomes a very sort of act of that thing itself. It becomes its own space of confinement and entrapment. And that's kind of what, what's quite important about the sort of installation of the piece is the very fact that it's doing what it says or it's doing what it's representing. So that's an important moment in this piece. So the third scene that I'll go to I feel like I'm going really quick. Third, Third scene, scene is a scene that I'll tell a little story before 
elaborating on this scene because it sort of goes in a direction that's very different from these these first two. So in probably 2011, Nardine had invited me out to Nazareth where her parents live and said, you know, come for dinner, meet my family. And, you know, just also we spent time in Nazareth getting to meet other artists and stuff. And and at one point, I would, as I was invited, I get to meet the family, and they basically left me sitting in the kitchen because everybody had things to do, which is not abnormal. And I was sitting in the kitchen, and it's kind of a, a rectangular kitchen, and at the end is the sink, and there's a door to the outside. And at one point, I'm just sitting there, and I noticed, well, I'll explain what I noticed and did notice, but her dad had sort of gone into the back room with, and came out with a funnel, a plastic funnel, and a bottle, and then disappeared out the back door into the, the sort of yard area in the back. Moments later, he comes back in with a bottle full of olive oil and goes back and puts everything back. Remarkably, I made nothing of this. I didn't even remember this. And it was only with the conversation with Nardine many years later where she sort of pointed this to this idea of the funnel. And I sort of then started to recollect this memory of, ah, so that's what he was doing. And I hadn't really sort of realized. You know, it's one of those imponderabilia moments in anthropology. Things just happen. You don't notice them because you're trying to think of things that are important. But this became actually a, a very interesting moment. And I started to realize that through these conversations with Nardine, that these, these small funnels are in every Palestinian home. They're, they're, there's many of them, indeed. It's not even just one. There's, they're all over. Comparatively, you find very few, if any, in Jewish Israeli homes. And the reason being is that for Palestinians, olive oil is something you don't buy at the store. Olive oil is something that comes from the land. It comes through your networks in the community. Ideally, it comes from your own family, your family's sort of olive orchards. And then it gets stored in, stored in large barrels, which you then keep for the year until the next harvest, usually in the fall. So you basically move your olive oil from that sort of barrel into the small jars, which then come into the kitchen. So this became an interesting way of thinking about this third scene. And Nardine sort of said, this is one of those sort of inspirations for the piece was thinking about that sort of everyday object that sort of just moves in every Palestinian life, but in a way that's kind of innocuous. It's, 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 it sort of goes unnoticed, right? And this for me became really interesting to think about how that became an inspiration for this piece alongside of a checkpoint, alongside of the way then this piece gets installed in a gallery to create the very effect that it's sort of trying to represent. So three different, really different things going on and very important. So this, this third scene is also about a connection to the land, right? It's not just simply olive oil. It's olive oil as for Palestinians, which is a question about land. And therefore, that, that sort of movement from the land into the home and that connection between land and home, which is fundamental. And we'll be talking about home in these pieces. So what do we do with this? Like, what, what does this artwork do? What is this artwork? What kind of social processes does it enact in, the, in, the, in what it's doing? So what I propose and what I want to think through and what I've been sort of working on for quite some time is this idea of thinking of the, the artwork, this artwork in particular, but artworks in general as assemblages. And, you know, there's a history of, th of thinking about assemblages in art, right? William Seitz did a, a very famous show at, I believe, MoMA in the 1960s called Assemblage. And it was a big show. And we have this piece by Jean Arc. And, you know, this is a, a, an example of art assemblage. You just you, you put pieces together of different things to sort of create an artwork. But this is very different from what I'm thinking about. And, and kind of maybe in the 1970s, a different notion of assemblage, well, 1980s, I would say more precisely, a different notion of assemblage enters into sort of our philosophical, social scientific discourse. And it's one that comes from the, the philosophers Je Deleuze and Félix Guattari, when they use this idea of agencement in French, which is very different from assemblage, and even different from the French assemblage, 
very different ideas. And I started to think about like what, what I found quite interesting about this theory is how it really sort of helped me relate and think about these disparate scenes, these three scenes that in a sense have no intrinsic relation to each other other than through the artwork. And how do you start to think about those three scenes? Now, just before I move on, I'll give you examples of other works that work with. This is a very famous piece that Félix Guattari refers to as the idea of an agencement in art. So it's basically cogs that actually don't function or do anything. They're not lined up correctly. So it becomes something that's made up of heterogeneous elements that actually don't sort of perform a function in their unity. And we can think of the assemblage in English and even in the French sense as the model plane you build or the sort of things that already come together in a way that fit together. And agencement is a very different idea in the sense that the things that are put together don't fit together. There's, there's a heterogeneous relationship between the elements related. But they're not a random collection, right? Now we can see here, this is Rena Banerjee. This kind of agent small work or assemblage work. We'll just stick with the assemblage in English, but with the, the referring to the French usage of the term. And here something is made using heterogeneous elements to create something new. And that's ultimately the ideal of a good agent small is it's not a whole in the sense of a unity or essence, but it is something new in its way that it puts things together. So the French word actually sort of means not to put something together into a unity. It actually means to arrange or to dispose or to sort of con uh, to compose, if you will, but without any sort of fixed unity or sense, because these kind of assemblages can also end. They can fall apart or they can become something more than they are, which we'll get to in a second. So what is important really in these works is the relation between the elements. And it's the way that, that they express a particular character when they come together. And that's kind of what I'm very interested in sort of exploring through this, this theory relating it to the artwork. But it's not just an assemblage, but it's about what it can do. And this is kind of what, what Deleuze and Guattari are really sort of emphasizing. And they actually say, we don't know what it is, an assemblage or an artwork as assemblage, until we know what it can do. And I think this really moves us past the question of representation. We can sort of say it is a representation, but in a sense, we're going that next level and asking, what does it do? What does this artwork do? So if we think about the three scenes, each of those scenes is already an assemblage. This sort of checkpoint apparatus is an assemblage, right? It brings together bodies. It brings together materialities. I have a list here of things. It brings together discourses. It brings together materials, concrete, cement, metal, bodies, guns, a whole discourse on occupation, a whole discourse on who was there first, a whole discourse on religion and politics and all these sort of questions get layered into these sort of moments, this checkpoint sort of moment. And the same with the, the second scene. The second scene itself is an assemblage. The second scene is an assemblage in the sense that here's an Arab Jewish cultural center that is itself trying to promote a certain discourse that's dis dictated by the state, but is actually sort of seen quite cynically by many Palestinians. But it's also an art show. So there's then the metal of the work. There's the bottle, this fragile glass bottle that sits at, at the end of this funnel in a very precarious state, right? So all these things become factors in that assemblage. And then there's the third. The third takes a very different trajectory, however. The third takes a very different trajectory in the sense that it, the assemblage there is the assemblage to home, family, land, trees, soil, environment, air, water, all the, and the bodies, the family of bodies that go out and sort of do the harvesting of the olive oil. So let me try to sort of bring some things together. In a sense, this artwork is an assemblage, but it's an assemblage of those three assemblages. It's an assemblage, it assembles those three scenes as separate assemblages into one artwork. And the artwork becomes an assemblage, but it becomes an assemblage in the sense that it reaches outside of itself. 
It's, it's not reducible solely to if we were to restrict this object to itself. This object is already then, in that sense, a multiplicity. It's already connected to other assemblages, to other networks, to other relations. And in a sense, it reflects the milieus that it is part of, those particular worlds and those particular sort of places that it's part of. And what's important is it's an invention. The idea that every assemblage is an invention. It's an invention of something new out of what is already given through the rearranging and dispos disposition of heterogeneous elements. So they create, in that sense, territories. Assemblages create these, these sort of, not territories in the little sense of spaces, but of places or land, but territories in the sense of a place where something can happen. And it does this through these three heterogeneous scenes. And in a sense, territories are always being made and unmade, constantly sort of being reinvented, constantly seeing coming together and moving apart. This isn't to say they cannot become fixed in a mobile, however. We see the checkpoints as an instance where the assemblage can come together and in fact become an apparatus of control. And for like these guys, Deleuze, Guattari, but also Foucault, the idea of the apparatus and the assemblage are very closely connected. There's a, there's a sort of close relationship between the way the two work. Now the question I sort of want to ask, but kind of leave open and I'm not going to answer it, Given the time, how am I on time? Three minutes? Okay. So, what I want to end with is if this artwork is doing something, what is it doing? And particularly, what I'm interested in is what kind of affordances, conceptual and political affordances, does this artwork allow? What does it sort of, you know, an affordance is sort of like a chair. A chair offers an affordance for you to sit down. And that's where the agency lies. It's, it's a, it offers the possibility of you can sit on it, you can stand on it, you can do things with it. That's the affordance of a chair. What does this artwork do? What are its affordances? How is this assemblage affording a way of seeing, a way of doing that moves beyond the sort of the, the, the particularity of each of the assemblages that it sort of has depicted? And in a way, what I want to point to is that sort of the third scene for me is really this fugitive moment, right? It's the one that sort of breaks and becomes something deterritorializing, right? It moves outside of the sort of confines of both the gallery, but also the checkpoint. And in that sense, it sort of also then points up to this idea that for a Palestinian to sort of go, I have this funnel in my home. What else do I have in my home? that could be used or thought about or that I become conscious of that can sort of be, in a sense, used as a form of resistance or even refusal or sort of this moment where it allows for a deterritorialization in a way. So I'll end there. And what I think what I want to do is come back to use these kind of questions about assemblage theory and the way I've kind of approached this art object to think about what Michael's done in this work on this mind map. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, the next speaker, Associate Professor Cindy Wang, is from the School of Art, Design, and Media in Nanyang Technological University. Cindy holds a BFA from the School of Visual Arts and an MA in New York University. Department of Graphic Com Management and Technology. Cindy's work engages contemporary visual communication design, graphic design, art practice, and exhibition approach, as well as design theory. Cindy's research focuses on exploring the aspect of Chinese cultural aesthetics as visual research, supported with practical examples of projects so that illustrations or rather illustrators and illu uh, designers can give their works a new layer of depth and provide their designs and products with a deeper appreciation of their culture and history over to you cindy okay um thanks michael so today i would like to share three projects of mine 
about how I explore uh, the way for making Chinese aesthetics uh, more accessible to everyone. Every day we are surrounded by art and design. Therefore, I took the inspiration from Chinese aesthetics by creating art and design. Then I portray them in a new and contemporary perspective. So from this point of view, the first project I would like to talk about from Chinese ancient pictograms to modern typography design. This project is how I explore the idea of the ancient origin of Chinese character as pictograph. I inspire from that. So I decided to use typography as pictograph to form my design concept. I took the simplicity and abstract shape as visual grammar. Then I incorporate geometric shapes and colors into contemporary Chinese typography design. The history of Chinese character began over 5,000 years ago. They were originally pictograms. So we can see all the images were drawn by people to communicate a coherent message. Today, these ancient pictograms are commonly known as Oracle Bong Sui. So here we see sun, tree, sun rising over the tree is the east. So this is how Chinese met their character. Just giving you more example, we can see ancient Chinese character were all illustrative in nature. So by, by referring to the ancient origin of Chinese character as pictograph, I used the idea of oracle bone inscription to create a new set of con contemporary Chinese typography design. This project is not only a study of Chinese uh, writing, but it also focuses on the design, showing a significant influence on how contemporary Chinese character can be created within Western context and approach by editing colors, lines, and shapes to replace the stroke of the Chinese character. In the design process, I try many visual experiments to taste with Chinese characters' form and appearance. So this is a, a character door, Men. When, when we add sun inside the door, the character become between Jian. There is a beautiful story behind this character. In the night, we can see the moonlight through the door gaps. And this is how Chinese met this character. Another character for a later time, by adding tree in the door, we also can say it in fence. So the idea of this project is by using simple shapes and graphics to replace some part of the Chinese character the character transformed to a graphical image and it makes the typography design become an art form. Then, the, um, then I decide to use exhibition as medium to send the message to the audience to tell the story and express the idea in diverse way. The exhibition was meant to be a way to have children think of doing. Therefore, this project has resulted in both academic and public context to exhibit in Taiwan, Kaohsiung, the Peer 2 Art Center that collaborate between Kaohsiung City Government and Nanyang Technological University. Um, so now I would like to show uh, a video about the exhibition.
I wish to end explanation and multimedia presentation to demonstrate my design outcome through different lens. It can offer many different feelings to audience and show how cultural art and design involve. I hope to give the general public to better appreciate the meaningful of uh, Chinese culture. Okay, so the second project is about traditional aesthetics principle from Chinese intending can be fused with daily object to kickstart a new creative process in design. The idea of this project is that by embracing both tradition and modern, the design approach can give modern product an extra layer of depth and it connects the user and their environment through daily interaction that give people a deeper appreciation for Chinese culture and history. So in this project, I focus on yin and yang aesthetics in Chinese in painting as a central basis for design philosophy. The design philosophy acts as a foundation for design thinking and practice applied in this design product. It involves the idea of fusing traditional aesthetics principle with a modern medium. By making this principle more accessible and providing new perspective on a glassware design, a modern medium in this project is a relevant object or product that is commonly seen and used in our surrounding. So from the theory of yin and yang, I come up the concept of virtual and real, invisible and visible. Then I find a suitable material for my design. Glass is not only functional, but it also possesses quality of beauty and elegance. As a material, glass has an ability to create both light and shadow. The transparent quality of glass allows light to fully pass through making it a suitable for expressing specific type of feeling and mood. Glass can invoke an emotional experience when we uh, interact with it. So we can see to incorporate the dimensions of invisible and visible, negative and positive space and implant lines. It creates a sense of mystery. It gives the viewer a chance to imagine and interpret the pictures in their own way. The direction of the lights create an overlapping effect where the graphic on the 3D glass become 2D on the surface of table. When the direction of light changes, the interacting graphics change. So by stacking and layering the different size of glasses with the addition of space between each cup, it creates a sense of depth between uh, the illustration. The interactive graphics can change when we are rotating the cup. It engages the user by allowing them to create new composition as an artist. When we add water in the cup, the reflection of light and water, it distorts visuals that engage the user imagination. So the intention of this project is to uh, improve the quality of life, to promote a seamless integration of art and life by creating designed objects that embody both aesthetic principle and functional designs. Therefore, I think Products can be both useful and beautiful. This glassware design explores the unique characteristic and merits of both industrial and traditional craft for producing delicate glassware for contemporary life. Okay, the, the last project is about uh, how Chinese aesthetics in Chinese ink painting can be applied into contemporary art design. The artwork is created based on the three important principles of Chinese aesthetics in Chinese ink painting, which is perspective, yin and yang, and space. And this is a framework of my creative component of this project. 
We can see the three depths refer to the spatial depth of the Chinese ink painting. There is the foreground, middle ground, and uh, background. These depths are also referred to as the near distance, middle distance, and far distance. The main element of painting are arranged along the central axis of the vertical uh, scroll. The pine tree and the land formed in the foreground, we can see they are connected in an S shape with the middle ground. When Chinese painter layering within the landscape and mountain peaks, we can see they are from the three main kind of perspective depiction. Sen Yuan meaning uh, deep distance, uh, Gao Yuan meaning high distance, and Ping Yuan meaning flat distance. So we understand the key essence in Chinese ink painting is the use of perspective, which is linear perspective, atmospheric perspective, the three depths and the three distance. Here we can see how the artwork was constructed. Three different colors of acrylic sheet represented three depths. The overlapping effect create a sense of depth a feeling of the distance, which can only be seen and felt by the viewer to the space, just like the Chinese ink painting. The idea, you, the idea of using light and shadow in the artwork was also inspired by the theory of yin and yang from Chinese ink paintings. The illustration was based on three different layers of acrylic sheet, and they are represented how a Chinese ink painting was created by the idea of linear perspective. Install the LED light, use the play of light and shadow, and this is what I want to further accentuate the three layers creating a depth, the interplay with with layering of the constructing signs and distance to create a sense of dimension. The notion of yin and yang thread to the interplay between complementary um, opposite pair with virtual and real, the hidden and visible, and the transparency and opaque. The transparent the transparency quality of the acrylic allowed the viewer to look through the entire artwork from the front to the back. The overlapping graphics resulting from the layer of the acrylic sheet create a sense of depth through the space. The principle of a, a perspective, yin and yang, and space are weaved into the concept of artwork is constructed from the arrangement of the acrylic sheet to the composition of visual presented. So, um, so from my project, I hope they can inspire other artists and designers to study historical work of art from the past to sift out visual principles that govern this artwork in order to create new work. Thank you. <laughs> Given, um, yep, I'd like to um, just briefly summarize uh, what I've just heard. I heard a number of um, crossings, crossings of places um, in what Given described as um, the three scenes uh, invoked in Nadine's work about the checkpoint. Um, um, the gallery system, and then what else? The kitchen, and the home, and the field, actually. Connected to the field. Um, as well as um, uh, the crossing of uh, time, right? Um, the invoking of uh, traditional uh, cultural symbols towards contemporary art and design. There is also the crossing of um, discipline. Uh, between art and design as kind of interface, um, different kinds of interfaces 
in relation to everyday reality. So, so I, I, I would like, like to um, ask you a question about um, art and design with regards to your interest, research interest, um, particularly uh, in relation to the what you are interested in, right? Um, I think design in in Cindy's work is really not just um, um, an instance of typography and whatever. There's a lot of design involved in your art exhibitions as as well. Uh, in your case, um, I think your the way you have read some of the artworks were very much uh, designed and controlled in a certain a certain sequence. We move from one scene to uh, another. So my question for you is, um, what do you think would be the most interesting or important relationship between art and design right? um, that you think um, we should be thinking about? Uh, whether it's um, the, the fact that they are different in some ways and where they overlap. Right? What are important um, connections between art and design in your research? To me, um, to me uh, will not be so different, but uh, I think a lot of people say uh, design should be have you know the purpose and art can be, you know, it's like more uh, self-expression. Uh, but uh, to me, um, it depends, you know, what kind, you know, like design and um, art you involve. But right now, a lot of, you know, like design, uh, also they want um, the, the outcome, it look uh, arti uh, artistic. So uh, not really, you know, like um, have a problem solving or purpose, you know, like driving like, um, uh, toward, you know, like your, your end outcome. So um, right now, you know, for me, I can say, you know, like art and design can be uh, exit, you know, at the same time, if, you know, and then, um, people will more appreciate, you know, like different, they can appreciate both. Yeah, so, yeah. And I think, you know, like the, from the tradition, uh, sometimes they always, uh, like student, they don't like tradition stuff, but it's, we, we, we really can learn a lot from the past and then uh, see how we can bring the past, uh, past uh, the stuff from the past, and then uh, how we can bring into like the modern uh, life. Yeah. So this is something we always can inspire from tradition, and then how we can see, you know, like to mix with the modern contemporary stuff. Yes. Given? Yeah. I mean, the. the I mean, in a sense, I think what I'm doing in what I presented is 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 a form of assemblage. I mean, it's not, you know, I didn't, didn't sit down and say, these are the three scenes and here's how you should put them together and here's the connections and relations between them. It actually is where the authorship lies is kind of blurred in that. It's going back and forth. It's, it's a series of experiments in conversations. It's a series of experiments with the object itself and thinking through and with that object. And I don't think, it quite ever finishes, right? I mean, we could probably continue. So in a sense, the design is falling in line with the assemblage theory again, right? I'm assembling it in a way so as to say something, so as to sort of evoke a sense of what the artwork is doing. So the design plays into that element as well, if, if we put it in that way, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, so Cindy mentioned about um, uh, invoking the past as a way to introduce to your students um, the richness of traditions and, and all that. Um, and um, in creating uh, assemblages, um, we're also, as you mentioned, using um, 
materials or objects from one time or one function and trying to, through juxtaposition and arrangement, uh, change its function for, for a new future or invent something new, right? So my question to you is, how, how do you think um, you deal with the past in a way that does not romanticize or fix the past as something um, locked in that whose story has already been exhausted mm. and, and allow some kind of uh, openness to um, even reading the past anew in, in when we invoke the past in the contemporary context? Me. <laughs> uh, for example, you know, like... Um, Today, I, I um, talk about, you know, the uh, Chinese aesthetics. I all inspire from uh, Chinese in painting. But, you know, when I give, for example, I give the topic to the student, probably the, um, like most of them will only stay in the typical, you know, their idea of Chinese in painting. And so it's like the brush, it's like the ink, it's like, you know, like the water. But actually, you know, like, if you really study, you know, like, Chinese uh, painter, how they compose, you know, like, their painting, and then, you know, like, the way they, of the, uh, their thinking, so, which you can go behind, you know, like, only just, you know, like, the, the ink, only just, like, uh, behind, you know, like, the, the brush. So, you really understand the central of what the painter they are thinking, their theory, then you you are able to use their idea of bringing to like for example, today I show two different projects. One was about like uh, glass. The one is about, you know, like I use the material uh, acrylic. So same same, you know, like you can we can understand their the theory of that. And then bring use different material and also with the different presentation of the idea of the uh, the culture, the tr uh, tradition. So this is something you know. Like when I um, do my research project, it's also al always you know like for me to demonstrate to the student and how they can do. So um, yeah, it's kind of like demonstrate demonstrate you know what we can uh, uh, even is the contemporary design we do you know graphic design with the uh, western uh, design principle but actually chinese aesthetics you know from chinese in painting or uh, calligraphy they, they also have you know like the the principle of we can we can do not only just deal with the traditional brush, uh, uh, brush yeah, work, but it's also, you know, like uh, we can do something else. Thank you, Cindy. So, um, so that reminds me of how um, Chinese ink painting and um, calligraphy, are, uh, in the training towards uh, being able to do that involves mastery or imitation, right? So kind of like uh, um, imbibing and hopefully understanding the spirit of how, how um, master uh, painters and calligraphers um, were experiencing. And then, and then from there, one then could choose um, where, how to move forward, perhaps to reinvent yes. and add to the past. Is that right? Um, I, 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 at this point, I just want to share a little bit about this this um, mind map because, as mentioned earlier, I was um, uh, um, uh, preparing for a solo show which um, was heading towards being purely sculptural. I was making different classes of um, sculptural objects that refer to traditional um, Chinese motifs or Chinese Peranakan motifs that could be found in a Peranakan household. Uh, for example, the phoenix, uh, the chilin, the hybrid um, lion. Um, and um, 
this mind map came as a kind of almost an um, afterthought or later part of the, um, the preparation because I, I, I realized that uh, the pure sculptural or visual presentation didn't quite work for me. I, I decided that I would need some kind of legend um, to help myself make sense of, of the project. So um, lear learning as I was trying to understand what's going on in this household was very much um, how I developed um, this work as well. So on the one hand, really what you have here are a, a selection of traditional Chinese legends, pun intended, um, legendary uh, figures, um, like um, the dragon, um, who is the ruler of the sea, um, the peony flower, uh, the king of flowers, and then uh, phoenix, the ruler of birds, and then one, one more down there. Mm. Right, and, and then surrounding, surrounding these four leadership positions are little fables, myths, and other stories. So, um, so for me, that that's that's um, an interesting point relating to how I dealt with the past. Actually, I was I was kind of I felt that I threw myself into a deep end, but um, found things that I needed to do in order to get a deeper experience into the, to the work. But um, given, given, do you have any comments on this uh, notion of how to, how to relate to traditional practices and materials and um, the past in general, how to relate to it in the present so that we are not just romanticizing it? I might go some way in answering one of the questions from from the audience. What is a key factor in assemblage that differentiates it from just a collection or composition of things? I think in that way, I mean, I kind of think like this, but I also think about what, kind of what I'm trying to do with the artwork I looked at was, it's not just a composition of individualized separate elements, but in, in the fact, what happens when you put these together as a composition, as an assemblage, is the capacities of those things change. What they can do, the meaning of those things start to change. And I wonder, like also, like in your work historically, what, as you start to invoke a, hist a history of Chinese painting, watercolor painting, how does it, how does it start to change when it starts to come into a composition with contemporary sort of forms, contemporary practices? So that's kind of how I would think about it. I mean, the funnel is not exactly something that just appeared yesterday. It's kind of something, the, the metal funnel actually existed prior to the mass production of plastic funnels. So she's also invoking a past in that as well. The small glass bottle is also this antique type bottle. So there is this invocation of the past that's taking place, but it's the composition, it's the sort of arranging and disposition of these elements that changes the way we then think about each of those elements already. In a sense, the composition is already sort of affecting what they can do, what their possibilities are, what they mean, their significance. And in a sense, that's why I think when I was talking to you earlier about this idea, what would happen if we started to put new things into here, right? What happens when we connect the orchid to something else? You know, what happens when the ant is no longer becomes not just prey but victim as well right all these sort of ways that in in a sense things can always shift in this thing and that's in a sense why the assemblage is always quite ephemeral right it can sort of both fall apart but it also can turn into something else it's kind of, it's constantly sort of i don't like these word but becoming it's in a process of becoming and it doesn't it's not like it's a finished product in that way so i think in that sense going back to her point about the chinese painting. I think that's an interesting, how is Chinese watercolor painting something not fixed in the past, but something that's constantly being reinvented? Mm. Thank you. So uh, I like your um, connection between this map and the possibility of uh, continuing to add uh, entries and data and even take out some things. Um, to be honest, when, when I was making this map, my ideal 
uh, version of it would be something a little bit more um, open and that rather than vinyl stickers stuck on the wall. This is like uh, reification and fixation <laughs> um, par excellence. Um, I would really love this to be, uh, to see this as incomplete and forever uh, changing, right? Um, I just want to uh, address another interesting question, um, which is about space. It seems like um, there is a shared theme of space in all uh, our um, um, topics of interest, right? Um, how does this play into Cindy's art and Michael's art, my art? Yeah. Oh, uh, I think, uh, of course, you know, like, um, if we really understand, you know, like, uh, Chinese in painting, uh, if we only see, you know, like the, the the painting itself, and then you understand, you know, like the perspective from the painter, then um, the perspective which is uh, for for painter to create, you know, like the depth. So the space in my artwork is like where I use the space and uh, use the material, and then use the space create the depth. Yeah, it's not like a um uh chinese uh painter they create you know like the, their painting in the vertical way but actually is kind of like different thinking of how i create the depth you know from the space yeah so this is mostly you know like if talking about the space is uh um, regarding to my work was like creating, you know, like the depth and dimension for that use the glass and the acrylic. Yeah. As for me, I think um, um, my relationship to space evolves over time. Um, I remember when I was uh, very young, I uh, was quite aware of changing cityscape around us. I was always looking into construction sites. Um, as I grew older, I also then started to realize um, the, cons um, the scarcity of, of space. It, mm -hmm. Every um, square uh, meter is, um, is uh, real estate, it's money. Um, but I think the most important thing um, I think about space is the not so obvious power relationship in there um, that is quite interesting in. Um, allowing for certain things to happen. Um, I mean, you mentioned about um, the checkpoint and the other scenes has really um, space, spaces um, imbued with the different kinds of power and control, different levels of uh, formality as well. And so that, that's really interesting for me. Yeah. Let's see. Um, there's a question about map. How do you start with the map by situating disparate parts or via a relationship between parts? That sounds like it's a question for me, but either of you can talk about it. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just answer it specifically to how I, I made this map, right? Um, uh, those of you who have seen this book will realize that I would say about 95% of the information are what you could find in um, uh, general reading sources, right? Wikipedia and books about Pranakan culture, right? Um, uh, stories about how the 12 zodiac animals came into being, how the cat kind of got dropped, right? So what, what I did was to really start with this aim, like, okay, I want to represent um, plants and animals that have been used as symbols. And I went to some of the source materials, cross-reference uh, them and um, create some kind of um, commonly agreeable passage about each of these entries. Um, with, with 
with this inkling that um, the use of symbols, um, especially natural symbols and supernatural symbols in uh, Chinese Peranakan households has something to do with um, human relationships, right? Um, that's why I titled this work an almost natural history of social relations because uh, a lot of these traditional um, legends and uh, animals and plants actually have kind of built-in lessons of how to be a, a good person, right? Um, let's see. Yeah. yeah, so the Jade Emperor, let me just read all this, this entry. The Jade Emperor ordered a race between the animals to determine their place in the zodiac the worst swimmers among all the animals was the cat and the rat. And why was the cat dropped and not the rat, right? Because they rode on the ox to cross a river in order to secure a place. The rat shoved the cat into the water and ran ashore, arriving in the first place with the ox the second. Henceforth, the rat and cat became sworn enemies. So I really like how these stories have may have some kind of connection to reality, uh, but it's also maybe creating some kind of moral lesson as well, that you know, um, if you are in the presence of your arch enemy, your nemesis, you know, you could be in for a hard time, you could actually perish. Right? So for me, that, that was, that was um, something um, indicative of how cultural symbols are often used for education about what is good life, good individuals, or good uh, society. Yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> about mapping? I mean, that's kind of one of the... I mean, one of the things I liked about this was it is a map. And maps are never finished, right? That's kind of, I had put an image, we didn't get to it because it was, yeah, it didn't, doesn't matter. But I took an image of that sort of top corner to think like, you know, you, there's old maps that sort of just kind of you know that it's, it's kind of the edge of the world and there's still yet more that could be drawn in or there's still yet to be discovered. It's still something new that we don't yet know. And I kind of felt that with this because you're always starting in the middle here, right? You're always starting by a line and kind of where that line then takes you. And, and I kind of like that idea that there could be lines that still, the map could, in a sense, have new lines that evolve out of it. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's interesting, interesting that, that I had lines, the lines were kind of functional and mm. um, serving purposes, and it would be interesting if some of the lines are leading to nowhere. Um, we have five more minutes for a couple of yeah. questions. I think this one is really interesting, connecting the two presentations. Mm. Cindy's design uh, made me think or ask the question, can assemblages work with human interaction because it brings to mind an exhibition this uh, person attended recently where visitors could interact with the work to change it, thereby bringing it another element of agency in the presentation of an artwork. Mm. Yeah, very much so. I think we are, you know, we enter a gallery, we've become part of that assemblage, right? We become part of what I mean, if, if NGS actually sort of does data tracking on us as we move through it, we become part of a bigger question about what we see, what we don't see, what gets moved, what these, these bigger questions about how works are put together, how they want us to see them and how we interact with them, for sure, yeah. We, we um, I mean, this panel is a kind of temporary assemblage. Yeah. <laughs> and whether this leads to something more. Or, or just, just we walk out the door, the door and never, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's, that's one, one of the questions just, just before that, if you don't mind, is just what is the effect when an assemblage comes together incorrectly? I think they're always experiments, right? It's always an experiment, and experiments most often fail for good reasons. Learning. Yeah. Cindy, do you want to talk a little bit about how your design connects with um, assemblages that could foster human interaction? Uh, Yes, uh, mm, some part, for example, you know, like uh, for the, the story of shape, uh, the exhibition, uh, actually was uh, purpose is 
provide the space, you know, for the children to learn about art and design and Chinese culture. So uh, not only in, in that uh, exhibition, not only I create the Chinese character, but I also use the uh, geometric shape to create uh, 12 uh, zodiac animals. So uh, from the video, I think, you know, we see one part, I create different kind of shape of the stamp. So then when children come to the exhibition, uh, in that area, they can use the, the, the shape, they can create their own, like, uh, Chinese character or, you know, like, uh, their, their art or the object or the animal. And um, it's quite popular because, you know, they all really enjoy, you know, like how just inspire them, not give, not to tell them, you know, you have to do like this, 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 but it's like inspiration, you know, like to inspire you so you can do anything, you, you can create, yeah. And then, you know, like the video is also kind of like a, um, showing them, you know, it's a possible from, the zodiac animal, for example, like um, mouth, and then you can become like the mountain and from the bird or to the uh, the fish. So the shape is, you can use the shape to do anything. It's not only, you know, like you, you limit by the shape itself. Yeah, so this is some kind of like interaction with the audience, you know, like, to inspire them what they can do. Thank you. I'm afraid uh, that's all the time we have today. I just want to do a wrap up by saying that um, with Kevin's presentation, we learned a lot about how an artist, in this case, Nandini, um, made reference to a particular um, site of control, uh, the checkpoint in uh, uh, Palestine um, that Pal Palestinians have to experience on a regular basis and how that connects to other scenes like the home, the kitchen, the, the, the gallery setting um, through the, the handling of materials, um, uh, content-specific materials to not just uh, represent that experience but actually um, repeat or embody that kind of um, experience. Um, and in Cindy's work when she uh, looks into pictogram, traditional uh, Chinese ink painting, and also Chinese aesthetics, and how it transforms into um, uh, contemporary artworks and design. We see a lot of possibilities of um, learning about the past, but also uh, setting it for contemporary needs and everyday realities. Um, uh, that leads me then to end this session with a lot of gratitude. Uh, um, and joy, um, and I would like to pass the mic back to uh, Danielle with some announcement. Uh, so that, yeah, thank you, Michael, uh, for helping to moderate this very enlightening, very interesting cross-disciplinary uh, conversation. So let's thank uh, all our speakers again one more time for their participation today. Um, in, in this panel all together. Um, and thanks to you as well, our audience, for joining us this evening. So if you would like to visit the Baba House, we have um, programs available, which you can see on these slides, so that you can also take a look at the mind map uh, in high definition as well, when you're right here. Uh, and also, um, please leave us your feedback uh, through the QR code that is displayed. Uh, we will also send a link through the chat. So that's all from us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.